You've probably seen speakers that have this flared horn shape before, maybe at an outdoor venue or a concert venue, or even an antique piece of audio equipment like this phonograph. At first you might think that the horn just serves to direct sound toward listeners, which is true, it does that, but it also makes the sound louder. And at first, you know, that doesn't seem to make sense. Obviously the horn doesn't take any power, so how can it actually make the sound louder? How can it amplify sound? So in today's video I want to talk about how this actually works and how you can use this concept to better understand electronics. First, let's verify my claim that the horn actually does increase the sound output coming out of this speaker. So I'm going to use a handheld sound meter here that reads off in decibels, and I'm going to turn on this amplifier here and just run some static through the speaker. So we'll turn the static on, and just holding the meter in air, we've got about uh, 70 to 71 decibels. So now we'll put the horn on. And it's reading about 72 or 73. Let's try the test again with a 1 kilohertz sine wave. And this time I'll hold the sound meter definitely off axis so that you can see that the um, horn is not just directing sound toward the meter. So we're at about 83 decibels. As you heard in the demos, the alignment of this horn on the speaker body makes a significant difference in the character of the sound and the volume. Remember that a 10 decibel change in sound pressure level is equal to a perceived loudness difference of twice as much. So uh, my neighbors can attest that a 3 decibel change is pretty significant. So let's take a look in here and see how this thing is built. The speaker has a magnet and a very rigid dome built out of a special plastic here and the dome is connected to a coil that's in the magnetic field and the dome is suspended by a fairly rigid piece of plastic so it can move up and down but it takes a fair amount of force to do so. When the speaker is running the electrical current that we put through that coil causes the dome to move up and down and it moves quickly enough so that the air in front of it is compressed and that compressed region of air expands outward eventually hitting the camera's microphone being digitized and sent through the internet to your speakers which move and create a pressure wave which expands out and hits your eardrums and that's how you're perceiving the sound. So if I suddenly wanted to make this louder for you, what I could do is make the dome move further so that the pressure wave created by this would be much higher in intensity. The problem is that this tiny little cone here is not in contact with very much air, so the only way that I can make this louder is by moving the cone further, basically putting more power into it even though that's not the best thing. If we had this cone much larger, then it would be in contact with much more air and it wouldn't take as much uh, linear travel to create that same pressure wave. And that's exactly what this horn is doing here. It's allowing us to take a small surface, a small uh, connection with the air, and making it a much larger connection in the front of this horn. Let me show you another demo that will make this clearer. This stick is cantilevered off the edge of a table, and its connection with the air around it is not very good. So that if I bring my fist down, the stick just bounces away because it isn't really connected to anything very solidly. However, if I put a newspaper across the stick, and make sure that the newspaper is fairly flat, when I hit it with my fist now, the stick actually breaks because the connection that it has with the air around it is now much better. The newspaper provided this matching between the stick and the air that caused so much energy to be transferred into the stick that it actually broke. You can think of the dome in this tweeter as sort of like my fist, where it has a lot of force, but the air doesn't put up very much impedance, and so there isn't really anything to push against. The horn provides this coupling between the very strong tweeter dome and the very weak sort of air. In other words, the speaker dome is a low impedance device, meaning that it's very strong, but it doesn't supply that strength over a very big area, whereas the air is very high impedance, meaning it doesn't take very much force to push it, but that force must be distributed over a large area to have a good effect. This concept of impedance matching shows up in electronics quite a lot, and instead of thinking about it in terms of force and area, uh, we think about it in terms of amps and volts. And so a low impedance device has high current and low voltage, and a high impedance device has high voltage and low current. 
but uh, ultimately if your impedances are matched, uh, you have good power transfer. However, if you have an impedance mismatch, just like with this speaker going directly into air, you're going to lose power because the systems are not well matched to each other. And I think it's helpful to think of it in physical terms, just like with this speaker system or the stick off the edge of the bench. The shape of the horn actually affects how it will do its impedance matching job as well. So a very common profile to have is an exponential curve. And this provides a good impedance match for many different frequencies. However, one downside is that the uh, pattern of sound that comes out of the horn is not as even as it could be. So there are other designs that take that into account. Another thing you might be wondering is why this is rectangular. It sure seems like round or square would be much more sense, you know, would make much more sense for doing this. The answer is just practicality. So since the shape of the horn does affect where the sound is directed, uh, in most, you know, clubs and concert venues, uh, everyone's ears are at about the same level vertically off the ground, but people are standing in a fairly wide horizontal pattern around the speaker. So really just this shape is just set up to fill that area with sound. Uh, it doesn't help to send sound into the ceiling or into the sky because it will either get lost or be reflected and not sound as good. Another thing you might be wondering is why not just make the dome bigger? If we have to go through all this impedance matching trouble with the horn, why not just make this whole thing larger so that it already has better coupling with the air, kind of like this speaker here? And the answer is that it's very difficult to make a dome rigid enough and lightweight enough that we can move it quickly enough and get high frequency response and also have good coupling with the air. So having this whole horn tweeter system is actually a better overall system in terms of efficiency than trying to make a very rigid, large tweeter. You also might be wondering why uh, horn tweeters don't show up in home audio. So for example, with this bookshelf speaker, there's no horn up in here. This is just a, a plain old dome tweeter. And the answer is that for home audio, typically the sound pressure levels aren't high enough to make this efficiency gain from the horn worthwhile. So if this small dome tweeter is you know, 50% as efficient as a horn tweeter, nobody really cares because you aren't running enough watts through this to really matter. But if you're running a concert venue or a club, you're basically very conscious of how many decibels you get per dollar, and you want that number to be very high. So if a speaker can be much louder, effectively much louder, just by putting a plastic horn on it, then that makes a lot of economic sense. This is also a horn speaker that has an interesting twist to it. If we take it apart, you can see that down at the bottom there, that amber yellow colored piece of plastic is the same as the horn tweeter we were looking at previous. That's the dome of the tweeter right there. And it's got a horn that comes up this far, and then this piece is just a hollow plastic cup. So it has a folded audio path. So the audio comes out of this horn, hits the inside of this cup, bounces back down to the bottom, and then comes out the front bell here. And the reason for this is that we still want to have that good impedance matching from the tiny little dome that's at the bottom of the speaker there, and you know the, the amount of air that's at the front of this. But in order to do that with an exponential curve, uh, it would take too, too much linear space. Basically, this whole horn would have to be very long. So we compromise a little bit on the audio quality. You'll know that these things don't sound that great. But we've basically wrapped that exponential horn up, folded it up, so that we can have that all working in a compact package. Originally, I planned to show the uh, current and voltage going into this speaker on the oscilloscope and then put the horn on and off it and show that the uh, power transfer was better through the whole system. In other words, the power factor would change, meaning that more total energy was transferred from the electronics through the speaker into the air. And we can measure that by looking at the phase of uh, current and voltage on the scope. Unfortunately, this didn't work. The amount of power that's lost into the, the uh, friction losses of the suspension in the speaker and the resistive losses of the coil in here are so much higher than the amount of energy that's actually transferred into the air that the, the difference on the scope was just not even perceptible and I looked very hard for it. The other problem is that uh, since we're working with fairly small quantities, the speaker has to be producing an awful lot of noise to make this measurement happen. <laughs> and so before my neighbors called the cops on me, I, I, I didn't want to continue with, you know, 100 decibel experiments here trying to look for this tiny difference in phase or whatever. So anyway, if you had try that on your own, I'd be curious if you get it to work out, but I, I wasn't able to make it. 
Okay, I'll probably do another video on impedance matching focusing a little bit more on the electronics, but I hope this was a good introduction for you. Okay, see you next time. Bye.